Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. My name is Christine Johnson, and I am the Senior Director of Alliances Marketing here at Snowflake Computing, and I'll be kicking off the webinar today. I'm joined by three colleagues. From Microsoft, we have Arsen Vlamirsky, Principal Azure Cloud Architect, and Jean Feroli, Director of Partner Development. And from the Snowflake side, we'll hear from Torsten Grabs, Director of Product Management. In today's session, we'll be discussing the Microsoft Azure and Snowflake integration, as well as running a brief demo. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, feel free to submit them into the Q&A panel on your screen, and we'll try to answer as many as we can when we do the live Q&A session at the very end. With that said, I will hand it over to you, Torsten. Thank you, Christine. Um, let's take a quick look at the uh, agenda. Um, so uh, we went through the welcome. Thank you, uh, Christine. Um, we'll do a brief uh, introduction into uh, Snowflake um, and talk about the main value proposition and uh, some of the architectural underpinnings for, for Snowflake. Um, after that, I'll hand it over to uh, Gene and Arsen to uh, uh, cover the Microsoft Azure side of uh, the work that we have been doing for Snowflake on Azure. And after that, I'll uh, uh, walk you through a uh, demo for Snowflake uh, on Azure. And finally, we'll open a, up the floor for a Q&A at the end. With that, uh, let's jump into the Snowflake introduction. So if you uh, think about the challenges that companies are facing today with the warehouses that they are using for their analytics, they fall roughly into these four categories that you see here on the slide. The first one is concurrency, the second one scale, the third one resiliency, and the last one, the fourth one security. Um, it's problematic to, uh, to address all the requirements from these four different categories with current existing data warehousing technology. And uh, let me start with concurrency. The goal here is uh, to support thousands of users for uh, their analytics uh, and beyond needs, sometimes with uh, hundreds of different applications uh, in a large organization that need to connect to uh, the, uh, the enterprise's uh, data warehouse. Uh, the problem here is that um, uh, all of these users and their applications are competing for a limited amount of resources with existing technology. Moving over to scale, um, one of the key requirements here is to have the ability to elastically grow and shrink capaci uh, capacity as uh, the demands from your workload um, grow and shrink over time. The, uh, the third one, uh, resiliency, um, oftentimes, enterprise data warehouse configurations with existing technology are very complex and also very expensive and very hard to, to operate. And a lot of that complexity and cost is owed to making sure that uh, these data warehouses are resilient to, to failures so they can achieve a true high availability configuration. Last but not least, uh, security requirements keep uh, constantly uh, changing. Just think of uh, the more recent GDPR requirements uh, that came out of Europe. Um, organizations are challenged to keep up with those requirements and uh, need to make sure that their you know, warehousing solutions um, are uh, compliant with uh, the current uh, legal situation. Snowflake from the, from the ground up has been uh, built to address these four requirement areas, concurrency, scale, resiliency, and security. And it's a true uh, cloud-born data warehouse. And uh, I'd like to walk you through, through some of the architectural underpinnings of how Snowflake achieves that in, uh, in the next slide. So one of the key ingredients of the Snowflake architecture is a very clear separation between compute and storage. Um, and uh, being a cloud foreign data warehouse, we rely on shared cloud storage uh, with the cloud providers that we're working with, Azure in this case. And the way that we've designed our cloud storage is uh, very flexible so that it gives you great performance um, uh, at great cost for both uh, structured data as well as semi-structured data. And we'll see some of that in the demo that I'll walk you through later today. So having put all of your data into a shared storage in the cloud that is managed and owned by Snowflake, now you have the ability to spin up independent compute clusters on top of that short, uh, that, that shared uh, storage area. 
And just imagine that if one of your teams wants to do data science over the data that, that you keep in, uh, in, your Snowflake, uh, in your Snowflake database, you can spin up a compute cluster that's dedicated to just that team. Now, if you have an additional team join, joining uh, that wants to just run a set of SQL queries, you can create them a separate cluster with independent compute resources that also access the same shared set of data uh, in your Snowflake databases. And you can keep doing that for other departments or for other workloads. And probably one of, uh, one of the most prominent ones here is the overall BI reporting workloads uh, for a large organization, which oftentimes has uh, hundreds of users with hundreds of concurrent queries. So here we're using Snowflake's ability to create multiple compute clusters that are all dedicated to the same warehouse, so to the same logical entity that your users are connecting to. So here, most typically in the BI space, you would be running a multi-cluster Snowflake warehouse uh, where the number of clusters behind the warehouse can grow and shrink depend depending on the number of users and numbers of queries that are being submitted um, by your reporting user population. So all of this is wrapped by, um, by what we call the cloud services for Snowflake, which make sure that, um, uh, that your environment is secure, that you can authenticate. Uh, it also keeps uh, track of availability and makes sure that there, if there are outages in some places that uh, you, your, for instance, your cluster is moved over to a different set of virtual machines. Um, all the metadata is kept in the cloud services layer and it also uh, takes care of transaction management. So one of the key, uh, key scenarios that this architecture enables is what we call workload separation. And you see this here in the slide already where your BI workload is running on independent resources from the SQL queries. Another very prominent example for this is uh, load scenarios where you want to make sure that uh, whenever you are loading large new data sets into your Snowflake database, the resources needed for that do not compete with ongoing queries, for instance, for your mission-critical BI reports. And again, this is very easy to achieve by just spinning up another warehouse, essentially creating another cluster in this picture here um, that provides the resources for the data loading operations. Um, so we have already uh, been working with lots of customers um, that are very happy with uh, the, the capabilities and the value proposition that uh, Snowflake provides. Um, we have more than 1,000 customers uh, that are using Snowflake. And if you look at this slide here, you'll find some household names on the slide um, uh, and some names from the uh, Fortune 100 as well. In addition to the large customer population that's already today using Snowflake for their analytics and BI needs as, a, as the underlying data warehouse solution, we also provide a large ecosystem of partners uh, that, can, uh, that can work with you and help you build uh, a Snowflake solution um, for, for your specific situation. And as you look at this slide, you'll find uh, partners that we've been working with uh, in uh, the ETL space, but also BI tools and obviously also system integrators um, that, that, that we've been working with. So with all this, let's jump over and take a, um, take a look at Snowflake on Azure and how we have, um, how we have designed and built uh, Snowflake on Azure. Let me start by calling out first the main principle that has guided our efforts to make Snowflake uh, available on Azure. We wanted to give customers choice um, uh, of the cloud provider that they wanted to, to run with and make sure that no matter what cloud, cloud provider they use, they get a familiar Snowflake experience. Um, with, uh, uh, with parity in the, uh, in the capabilities across different cloud providers. Um, and we have been working very closely with the Azure team to make this possible. And some of, the, uh, uh, some of the new features that have been coming out of Microsoft Azure, we have been early adopters for them. To, uh, to just name a few here, so we have been using the limitless storage account capabilities in Azure for the Snowflake storage that underlies uh, your Snowflake databases in Azure. We've been also using the soft delete capability in Azure to give us additional protection against um, uh, accidental data deletion. And uh, from a performance perspective, we are re relying on the accelerated networking capability in Azure. Um, and uh, overall, it has been our goal to, uh, to, be, uh, to reach parity uh, in terms of the feature set the, uh, and the experience for Snowflake across cloud providers. 
Um, we have added additional capabilities to the surface area in Snowflake that allow us to embrace uh, the surrounding cloud providers, in this case, Azure. And as part of the demo, I'll highlight a few of those capabilities. Uh, most of them relate to integration with uh, Azure services. And probably the most prominent one is, is the ability to integrate with Azure storage for data loading and unloading scenarios. Um, Snowflake on Azure is currently available in uh, the Azure East US 2 region, and we are working on uh, other regions, other Azure regions uh, to follow in the next couple of quarters. So um, now looking at the, uh, the overall promise in terms of parity uh, for the Snowflake experience and Snowflake capabilities, I want to mention a few things. The, uh, the first one is, um, no matter what cloud provider you choose, you can, uh, uh, you can pick and choose from the same set of Snowflake editions that give you different capabilities from a performance perspective, security perspective, and data retention perspective. Um, we've applied the same principle to pricing as well. So no matter what uh, cloud provider you choose, the prices for Snowflake are the same across uh, the U.S., across cloud providers. And um, probably uh, the area where we spend most of our time uh, in, in terms of the engineering effort was uh, to make sure that also the performance experience is, uh, is comparable across uh, cloud, uh, cloud providers. And we have spent a lot of time together with the Azure team um, to, to make sure that this is the case. Now, having said this, um, uh, if you look at the right-hand side of uh, the slide that is currently in the slide view here, it gives you a brief description of the architecture stack of how Snowflake runs on Azure. At the bottom of the stack, obviously, is, uh, is, is Azure storage, and we are relying on, uh, on, on many Boss storage accounts uh, distributed across a number of subscriptions um, to store Snowflake data and Snowflake databases. Um, so that constitutes the shared uh, cloud storage that we uh, talked about in the previous uh, architecture overview slide. Now, the compute capabilities that we saw in that slide, they're implemented for Snowflake on Azure in, uh, by Azure Compute. So we're using a set of VMs to, uh, to, to, to build your Snowflake uh, clusters and, and warehouses. And then on top of that is the cloud services stack um, with a load balancer that's being used for you to connect to your specific Snowflake account. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as part of the demo as well. So one of the customers that we've been very fortunate to work with over uh, our journey uh, to Azure has been uh, Nielsen. And uh, let me jump back here. And uh, you can see on this slide, you can see the quote from uh, Srini, uh, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Nielsen Bai. Um, and they're one of the first customers uh, that we started onboarding into Azure. Um, and they are running already today a very demanding, um, a very demanding production workload on Snowflake on Azure. So with that, I will hand it over to, uh, to the Microsoft team to uh, go through the Azure overview. Hey, hey, thanks. Yep. Hey, thanks, Jordan. It's Gene Ferrioli. So, uh, my role as the partner development manager for Snowflake is to focus on the build with and then with sell with. So, for the next couple of slides here, we're going to kind of talk about the overall partnership with with Snowflake. Uh, you know, we want to provide high confidence to our customers that Microsoft is fully committed to supporting Snowflake on Azure to fully commit our resources, and we'll talk about the the executive and engineering alignment on that. But, you know, on this slide here, we're kind of discussing Microsoft Azure Cloud Platform. As you know, you know, it's our cloud computing platform. We came out with it and announced it originally in 2008, as some of you may remember, as Project Red Dog. And we went full GA in September, I should say, February of 2010. So Azure's been around for a while. Uh, you're looking at here, we have customers that have adopted the platform. GE, for example, uh, GE Healthcare specifically, they created uh, medical analytics solution to provide a better patient experience. So we look at that from uh, looking at healthcare vertical. Maersk, you know, reduced costs by moving their data center workloads to Azure. Heineken uh, has a lot of digital marketing campaigns where they see uh, spikes in demand and they leverage Azure for these types of seasonal campaigns, uh, which help reduce their costs and then we're able to scale and perform to essentially meet their, their requirements. So, 
those of you that have been following Azure for a while, you can see that our big bet is on our cloud platform. From top down, we're fully committed. Uh, as you could see last year when we made our, our announcements back, uh, our earnings announcements in July, our cloud business, specifically to Azure, grew 89% from prior fiscal year. So tremendous growth, tremendous adoption, uh, you know, from top down direction to our field sellers. We're helping our customers truly to understand business problems. We really understand and, and know that we need our, our strategic ISVs like Snowflake who are the experts in their industry to build solutions to meet customer demand and customer requirements. And we're pivoting you know, as a company to realize that, that Azure in itself is, is basically a platform or what I call a bunch of Legos. And it's those ISVs like Snowflake that take those Legos and they build solutions from them to meet real customer demand and customer need uh, to solve those customer problems. Now, if we look at the points of presence here, you know, you can see that the, the commitment, again, from Microsoft to be a true scalable cloud platform to, you know, in this 50 Azure regions or data centers uh, actually went up. It's actually at 54 now, last check. So we have 54 regions that are worldwide where you can land your data. And we understand enterprise customer needs. You want to land data close to your users. Uh, you want to have data integration close to your employees, close to your, close to your customers. You may have certain geo type of restrictions where data can't leave that particular geo and you want to ensure that you have high confidence that that's going to happen. That shows the investment, the commitment that we're providing here uh, to ensure that we can scale globally and that we can work with ISVs like Snowflake to build a true cloud elastic scalable solution. So as we move on here and thinking that with Microsoft and security, I, I've been at Microsoft for about 21 years and security is always top of mind. You know, those of you that remember early 2000s uh, blaster slammer days knew that that was the security wake up call where we really took it seriously or even more seriously to, to build security as part of the SDL. And as you can see here, we took that same, those learnings and we made sure that that was part as we created our, our data centers, that we have global types of certifications like uh, SOC 1 and SOC 2 compliance. We look at industry-specific certifications like HIPAA, uh, and then regional based on, on specific geo requirements here. Uh, you know, we talk about trust in the cloud, and we talk a lot about it, but this shows the action of, you know, say we do, do what you say, uh, and you can show the certifications that we have here, and this is just a few of them. We have many more that are not displayed here, uh, and it's only a, 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 a sampling. But we really take security, privacy, and transparency uh, to heart. And as you can see here, that we have these certifications. So finally here, as we talk about the, the partnership, you know, this is an exciting time at Microsoft as we look at our ISVs, as we look at Snowflake, and looking at making sure that, you know, ISVs like Snowflake are successful, ensuring that we have executive sponsorship at the top, where we have you know, Bob Muglia, who is the CEO of Snowflake, former CVP of Microsoft and Server and Tools, you know, he knows the Microsoft way. He has already relationships with the Microsoft executives, and he meets with them on a regular basis from Satya to Scott Guthrie and so forth, where, uh, you know, we're constantly talking about how things are going. You know, are you making forward progress? What are the things we could do better? Looking at uh, reflecting and, and, and taking an open growth mindset to ensure that we're, we're working together to make sure that the customer experience we provide is a great one. And I can tell you from the engineering collaboration side, the teams talk on a regular basis, from the Snowflake engineering side to the Microsoft Azure engineering side, fully committed to helping Snowflake be successful and therefore our customers be successful also. Uh, I was just on a meeting the other day that if we get towards or work towards our uh, 924 GA or full GA support, which will be announced at this night, you know, we want to make sure that there's nothing blocking that date. You know, every day we're looking to make sure that we're green across the board as we continue to, to look at uh, landing Snowflake in Azure to provide the best experience. And as we look at that and landing it in an Azure, we look at how do we make sure that the customer experience is the best one, not just from the usage perspective, but as we work together to understand your needs, what are you trying to accomplish, and then looking at how we align our respective field teams. What we don't want to have happen is that our Microsoft field team says, hey, you know, this is what you want to do, and Snowflake team has, hey, this is what you want to do based on just particular technology, but rather have the two teams together work and understand and collaborate to understand your business need. What is the problem you're trying to solve? And then look at what is the best solution 
to address that problem. Uh, you know, full transparency, we do know is that, you know, we do have Azure SQL DW, which is our DW service. Snowflake provides their DW service. The key point is this. We have a program where we are paying our sellers on ISV revenue. Essentially, what this means is this. We have our first party services around data warehouse. Our sellers get paid the same, whether it's a first party data warehouse or whether it's Snowflake's data warehouse. We did this to make sure that our field clearly is aligned to Snowflake's field team to be aligned to what the business need is and what the customer problem we're trying to solve. That way we can focus on solving problems and not just trying to check a quota box because our field sellers get paid regardless and we know this lands on Azure. So as long as the service lands on Azure, meets the need, then the customer wins. And that gets into customer choice, right? We want to provide choice and, and we get the question, well, why are you guys supporting Snowflake? You have a service. Well, we want to provide that choice. We said Sati on down, we are an open platform. We want to provide you know, the capabilities to have Snowflakes out there to be able to develop their solution. We want to have it to provide a great first party experience type of solution. And that's what we're doing. Fully committed to providing that choice, fully committed to be aligned uh, from a seller perspective to understand your need and then addressing your needs with the best solution. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Arsene who's going to go through now into the technical deep dive of Snowflake on Azure. Thank you, Jean. Hello, everyone. I'm Arsene Vladimirsky, and I'm part of the commercial software engineering team at Microsoft. Working with our high-impact organizations like Snowflake on their journey to Azure Cloud. It is my pleasure to be here today to tell you about integration points between Snowflake and Azure Data Services and to share with you a couple high-level reference architecture examples for end-to-end -end data processing and analytics using Snowflake and Azure. But first, I want to touch on some of the common cloud data warehouse scenarios that we see with customers in Azure. So as you can see on this slide, you know, there, we highlighted just a few of the scenarios that are common, and there are many more. But to, to understand why customers are picking cloud for their data systems is the focus on data and not infrastructure. Customers are focused on digital transformation of their businesses. They do not want to spend time that doesn't add value to that on managing infrastructure. Uh, and having a managed service in the cloud is one of the key value propositions that customers are looking for. Not just being in the cloud, but actually having it be managed. In addition, customers are looking to be able to scale their storage and compute elastically, taking advantage of the clouds capabilities to add storage as needed without having to go through procurement of fans and uh, compute nodes for the servers, and to be able to grow with the data growth. Because now, as, as we know, customers are not sure which data is relevant, which is not, and they are trying to build data lakes and store a lot of data, and that obviously increases the cost, and having a, an elastic and cost-efficient storage in the cloud is a key value proposition. In addition, customers are looking to be able to analyze that data in time that's relevant to their business processes. That means they want to be able to scale the compute when they need a lot faster processing or pause it or turn it off to slower volumes when not necessary. The next pattern we see is customers modernizing their data platforms. Basically, as their on-prem data warehouse appliances may be coming of age, and need to be refreshed. Many customers who anyways have goals of moving off their data centers into the cloud in general are looking for cloud native solutions. Some customers are keeping their data on the prem for foreseeable future, but they're still using cloud. They're using cloud for hybrid scenarios where maybe the main data set is on prem, but they're feeding that data into the cloud and creating data marks that are isolated from their on prem system, which may be already overloaded, to give their data science and developer teams a way to run reports and do investigative analytics in the cloud without taking advantage of the overloaded hardware on-prem. And other customers are doing database consolidation. They may be over the years have a lot of databases, maybe purchase companies, and each one has a different infrastructure and different types of software running. They're oftentimes bringing it all together and bringing it into cloud, into a scalable system that can take all of that and run it as one holistic system. Finally, the most important, I think, a point and a pattern, a scenario, is building the new advanced analytics applications. The whole goal of this is digital transformation, as I said. Customers are looking for value adds to their 
for their businesses that are not necessarily just engineering work or IT work. They're looking to build applications that will enable them to do that, and many of these applications, such as SaaS services, are cloud-born applications, with data being generated in the cloud in a variety of formats not just structured data, but semi-structured data, data pulling from applications uh, running on mobile devices, sensors such as IoT in formats like JSON, Avro, Parquet, XML, etc. They need a way to take all of that data and process it together. And sometimes some of the systems on-prem may not be capable of doing that, and sometimes it doesn't make sense to bring the data from the cloud back on-premises. So using a cloud-native data warehouse is a solution that solves that problem. And finally, the, one of the most important parts is applying machine learning and other more advanced analytics to that data, which may be running inside of the database engine, but oftentimes outside of it, using technologies as we'll see on the next slides. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the specific integrations that exist as, uh, today already uh, with the Snowflake Preview Service and Azure and Azure Services. And uh, let's go one by one just to understand how the integrations uh, are happening and what you can do in your situation. So as Thorsten described, the internal, internal part of Snowflake's cloud native architecture is storing data on elastic and massively scalable storage that's durable, that is already uh, replicated multiple times in the cloud and does not uh, does not disappear. Uh, so that is the Azure Blob storage. The ability, that's what Snowflake uses as its storage engine. But data can also be loaded from your own storage accounts, either Blob storage accounts or data lake storage generation two accounts which use the Blob API storage API, same APIs, into Snowflake database in an efficient parallel manner in a very high performance way. Instead of going through one connection, it can load very much in parallel. Snowflake has a standard SQL ODBC connector, allowing it to be invoked from Azure Data Factory today by running a self-hosted integration runtime on a VM in the cloud, very simple installation. You can also use Power BI desktop service to connect directly to Snowflake, and Thorsten will demo that later, and upload those reports into Power BI service to share with your team, and the reports will be refreshed either directly or on schedule via data gateway VM running it. Snowflake provides a Spark connector that could be used from Azure Databricks Spark service or Azure Insight Hadoop as, uh, as a service. From both of these platforms, importing a Spark connector allows Spark applications written in Scala or Python to be able to store data and pull data out of Snowflake. And you will see that in the reference architecture in a minute. Finally, as many customers are moving from uh, on-prem to the cloud, they're looking for efficient ways to move a lot of data. So there are multiple options existing for that. One option is to copy the data into Azure Blob Storage using very efficient transfer tools that we have, including Data Factory, including AZ Copy and other tools, or including our partner tools as well. But in addition, it's possible to ship data from on-premises in rugged and encrypted secure devices uh, that are currently in preview called Azure Data Box. Those devices would arrive in data centers, and data will be uploaded into storage accounts that then can be loaded easily into Snowflake. And as a final item, it's important to understand Snowflake also provides integration with the Azure Active Directory through federated authentication and SSO, allowing user credentials to be uh, not stored into locations. Integration with many of the other Azure services is currently possible and easily achievable via Azure Blob Storage as the hub and staging source and destination for that data. And this is a current snapshot of integration. Uh, a lot of work is ongoing by both companies to make these integrations even more efficient and convenient for the customers. With that, let's take a look at a simple reference architecture of Snowflake Lada Data Warehouse running on Azure. So if you look in this diagram from the left side, you will see the common structured data sources like line of business applications, customer relationship management systems, and on-premises databases. Lower on the list, you can see unstructured data or semi-structured data flowing in from cloud applications, IoT devices, telemetry, social data, or even images and videos, which uh, are born in a cloud and live there very nicely in blob storage. So Azure Data Factory, which is our managed service, a data integration and orchestration service, allows to automate data movement and transformation with dozens of data source connectors. It can move that data from the on-prem sources or from other databases in the cloud and land it in a scalable blob storage or Azure data lake storage, which are both uh, 
equivalent API protocols, and this Azure Data Lake Storage provides a hierarchical capabilities above and beyond what an object store does, but under the surface, they're both using the same uh, Azure Blob Storage capabilities in Azure Cloud. So once the data lands there, it can be left there in its raw form, uh, in a cost-efficient tiered manner, or it can be processed by all of the Spark engines and all of the ML uh, applications that you can have running in Azure on top of Azure Databricks service within Spark or within Azure other applications in the cloud or on-prem. The data could be aggregated, processed, and loaded efficiently, the subset that you care about for your BI insights and reports, into Snowflake and Azure in a scalable manner. You can load all of the raw data as well if you choose so, uh, but loading subsets of data allow for a more efficient uh, usage of that blob storage for storing data you're not sure about. Once the data is in Snowflake, it can be accessed from Power BI reports with the, the data gateway running on a virtual machine in the cloud making it completely seamless. And as you can see on the bottom of this diagram, this is just a small sampling of the partner ecosystem. There is a very rich partner ecosystem from both Microsoft Azure side and Snowflake side on partners that work both on the data ingestion and orchestration side as well as on data visualization reporting side. And there are many more that are not listed on the diagram, but this is just to give you some ideas of if you are using these tools, you can connect them uh, to the sources and to the destination of data. And finally, I just wanted to share with you a reference architecture for a streaming analytics workload with Snowflake and Azure. So a little different than the previous slide, but again, we do have still our reference data that's sitting in those primary databases that talk about who are the customers and what are their orders. So Azure Data Factory continues to be used in that architecture to move the data into Azure Blob Storage. But at the same time, we have IoT and telemetry and social data that may be streaming in millions of events per day, per hour, per minute, and needs to be ingested. Azure provides services, managed services, such as Azure Event Hub and Azure IoT Hub for ingesting those events and streaming them directly into a Spark processing engine or through our managed Azure Stream Analytics complex event processing service and aggregating, counting per hour, per minute, per second, windows of that data, storing it in blob storage. Once the data is again in blob storage or in Azure Data Lake storage, Snowflake has capabilities to load that efficiently without coding into relevant tables by watching for new files, lending there and loading them into tables that were defined. And the users, most importantly, all of that is done for those personas of users who are sitting on the right of this diagram, either the business decision makers looking at a dashboard through Power BI or the data science or developers who are trying to run some Jupyter notebooks on top of Spark and on top of Snowflake at the same time to pull the data out to come up with new insights, new models, et cetera. Next, I want to hand it over back to Torsten who will give a demo of Snowflake and Azure demonstrating some of these capabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Arsene. Um, through the next couple of minutes, I'd like to show some of the uh, Snowflake on Azure capabilities. Uh, before I switch over into um, screen share, I want to briefly walk you through uh, the demo scenario so that you uh, get a sense of what we're trying to, to build here. So walking through this slide from left to right, we'll be working with uh, two different data sets. So uh, at the top, you see order processing data, and we'll use the customer table from uh, TPCH, which uh, is stored in Azure Blob Storage, and load that into Snowflake as a first step. The second data set uh, that we uh, would like to bring into Snowflake is uh, uh, online uh, clickstream data. Actually, I uh, put together a set of uh, tweets um, and it sits in uh, an Azure Data Lake uh, storage uh, Gen, Gen 2 um, container. And again, we'd like to, uh, to load that into Snowflake. Um, we'll go through the loading process using the Snowflake Web UI. And as part of using the Snowflake Web UI, we can also explore a little bit more of these capabilities that uh, we briefly spoke about. So for instance, Snowflake databases and Snowflake warehouses and clusters and capacity, we can illustrate hopefully uh, in the Snowflake uh, web UI. And then last but not least, I'd also like to really put together a, a quick Power BI report on top of these, uh, these, these two data sets just to show some of the uh, integration with, uh, with 
uh, Power BI and uh, uh, the, the broader Microsoft ecosystem. So let me switch over into screen share. Let me share my whole screen here. And could I have a quick feedback from um, people on the call uh, if they can see the screen? Yes. Yep. Excellent. So here we are in uh, the Snowflake web UI, and that's probably the easiest way um, how to connect to your Snowflake. At the end, I'll show how you can actually create a Snowflake account yourself uh, by using um, our Snowflake trials. Um, what characterizes a Snowflake account is a URL like the one that you see up here. And by putting that URL into a browser, you can open up this, uh, this, this web UI that we're looking at right now. And in the web UI, you can see there are different tabs, the databases, warehouses, worksheet, history. We'll cover all of those in the next few minutes, but I'd like to start off in the worksheet here and illustrate some of the data loading capabilities. So first of all, I've created a database uh, that I'm using here. Let's uh, create a um, new schema, and then we'll run a use schema statement to uh, go into this schema. And then now the next step is probably a little bit more interesting. So here you see the create state uh, stage statement, which is our ability to integrate with external storage providers for data loading and unloading scenarios. In this case, the stage that I'm creating takes a URL that points into Azure Blob Storage with uh, a set of uh, credentials here. I'm using the SAS token, which is the preferred way to, uh, to, to authenticate against the uh, Blob Storage account from Snowflake. Now, um, let me create this stage and then jump over into uh, another browser window. So this is the Azure portal, and it, uh, it currently shows the storage account behind the stage that we just created. Um, and it's a regular storage account, and it has a TPCH folder here with uh, the familiar data sets for the TPCH benchmark. We are going to be using the, uh, the customer data um, uh, at a one terabyte scale. And you can see the load files here as GZIP compressed CSV files sitting in uh, the blob storage account. So we have created this stage, which essentially gives us the ability to connect to this storage account that I just showed over in the, uh, in the Azure portal. Let's also create a table here. This is the customer table following the uh, TPCH definition. Um, and once we have created the table, now we can start loading data into, into the table. So let me, uh, let me kick this statement off, and it will run for about half a minute. And what this statement does, it uh, takes the, uh, the stage that points to Azure Blob Storage, navigates into the customer folder, um, and then picks up all the files that are sitting in, uh, in, that, in that directory, in that folder over in Azure Blob Storage. And you can see that we're using the file format for CSV and GZIP compression. And all the data, all the files sitting in that location are then imported into the uh, customer table that we just created. And you can see from the output down there, uh, we found about 250 files, 256 to be pre precise. And you can see a little breakdown of uh, the load operation as results for all of the files that we have loaded. Let's see how many customers we actually loaded. And this should be 150 million, which, uh, which should be the right size for the, uh, the one terabyte TPCH scale. Um, let's run another little simple sample query here just to show a few rows from the customer table. And uh, for those that are familiar with the TPCH benchmark, this will look familiar. So this is the artificially created uh, generated data set for, for TPCH. So as you see right now with uh, a couple of SQL statements here and the data set available in Azure Blob Storage, we're up and running and running our first uh, Snowflake uh, queries just uh, within a couple of minutes. So with that, we have loaded a, the first data set that I showed in the demo overview, our customer data set. So let's go ahead and um, look at the second data set. Uh, um, in this case, um, tweets from our customers. 
And here I'm defining a second stage that points to a different location in uh, block storage, again, using the familiar syntax with the URL and SAS tokens uh, as credentials. So let me jump over into, um, into the, uh, uh, the Azure portal again, and you can see here um, that uh, it's a storage account. Now the interesting piece that I do want to call out for this storage account and also show you is that we're using the Azure Data Lake Gen 2 preview for this storage account. So you can see here in the configuration that the hierarchical namespace for ADLS Gen 2 is enabled. And if I jump back into the overview and navigate into the blobs, we find the customer tweets here. And you can see that this is a bunch of JSON files that's sitting uh, over here. So um, having defined this stage, uh, let's uh, throw in another concept here, which is the file format. And let, let's create a file format that knows how to parse JSON and then use this file format to access the stage directly with a simple query that uses some of the built-in Snowflake capabilities to deal with semi-structured data. And the syntax that I'm using here is um, as I retrieve uh, the data set from the stage, uh, the data is rendered as a variant column in Snowflake. I'm referring to this variant column by this $1 syntax, and then I'm using the uh, uh, colon field um, um, syntax to, um, to navigate to specific fields in my JSON document. And you can see if I jump over here into WordPad, my JSON documents all carry this customer key field here and then a second field for the actual tweet that has been posted by the customer with that given ID. So I've been running this query now against the, the raw data in the stage, and it shows me those customer keys and the actual tweet as a JSON structure that I can look at as well. So let's pretend that this is the right shape for the data that I want to pull in. Then we can again create a table to hold that data, and then here in this copy statement, um, I, uh, I can uh, then load the data from uh, ADLS Gen 2 into a Snowflake table via this stage that we have uh, defined over it. And again, that's, that's going to take a couple of seconds. Um, one thing to keep in mind here is that this actually goes against a remote region. If I jump back into the Azure portal, into this storage account, that we were just using. You can see that the location for the storage account is best US2. And uh, as you may remember, Snowflake on Azure runs in East US2. So we have been pulling this data set um, across the continent in uh, just 15 seconds. And to get a sense of how much data we, uh, we got, this is about 3.2 million tweets that we loaded. Um, and if you look at some of those tweets, then you can see the structure again. Here is again the JSON rendering of the tweet as it is delivered by the uh, Twitter sample UIs. And um, to run a little bit more interesting query, let's look at the last SQL statement that I have down here. So this is a select statement that joins uh, the tweets table with the customer table using the customer key from both tables. And then it applies a filter where we're looking for customers with a specific phone number. Um, so you can see uh, now this statement runs in a couple of seconds and comes back with this one row. And let's use this as a starting point to explore a little bit more uh, the, uh, the web UI and some of the uh, Snowflake capabilities. So if I click on the query ID here, it takes me over into a view where I can explore the query plan behind this, uh, behind this query. And um, as, we, uh, as we look at it, you can see there's a table scan for the customer table and for the tweets table. Then there's a filter for the phone number. And then there's a join that's implemented on top of both before returning the result. Um, you also see an overview with uh, performance statistics on the right-hand side of the profile view here. So you can, for instance, see how uh, the, the I.O. was uh, done, how many bytes were scanned as part of the query. In this case, roughly uh, almost 12 gigabytes of data have been processed. And it also gives you information about how well Snowflake's multi-tiered storage architecture has been used 
Um, so uh, Snowflake built a cache uh, locally on the disks in the VMs in its clusters as uh, it's process, processing the workload that you submit. And in this case, you can see that the query has been, uh, has been answered to 95%, almost 96% by data that was locally uh, uh, cached on the VMs that are backing this, uh, this, this most like warehouse. Um, and only very few of these, uh, a very few of the data has actually been sent uh, over the network and has been retrieved from remote uh, storage. And then at the top, you see a more detailed breakdown of the processing between CPU, local I.O. and remote I.O. versus uh, network communication as well. Now, this is a detailed view into this query that we have run. You can also get a sense of the overall workload that has been running in, uh, in your account by looking at the uh, history breakdown. So this here shows you all the queries that we have run with a few of these statistics, detailed statistics broken out as well in this view. So this is the history view. We already spent uh, time exploring the, uh, the worksheet view by running these SQL queries. As you probably saw when we were working with these SQL queries, you also have an uh, object explorer like you on the left of the worksheet that gives you the ability to see what databases, what schemas, what tables are present in, uh, in your Snowflake databases, which leads us to the database tab here uh, on the left. So in the database tab, uh, first of all, you can get a top level view of all the databases that are in the account. And you can see that I'm sharing this account with a number of other uh, Snowflakes. As, as I click into the test DB that I've been using, you can see these two tables that we have been working with. And you also get a sense of their sizes. So we have 3.2 million tweets, 150 million customers. The size of these tables has been imported. So the tweets are two and a half gigabytes roughly and the customer table are just about 10 gigabytes. Then you have uh, additional tabs for you, views that you may have defined, your schemas, uh, you see the demo schema that we created. You have a view for the stages, and you see the two stages uh, that we went through as well uh, as part of the demo. Now probably the most exciting part, at least for me, uh, in the web uh, UI is to take a look at uh, the warehouses. And uh, the warehouses essentially is the compute capacity that you run to access the data that you put and stored in your Snowflake databases. And um, you, you have several different dimensions how you, can, uh, how you can create and scale and manage your compute capacity. So let's take a look at the demo warehouse first that we have been working with uh, for the SQL statements. So the first piece here is to take a look at the load history, uh, which you can look at over time. And you can see that I've tried out my demo about an hour ago, uh, an hour and a half. And now uh, you can see the activity from the demo that we were running. In addition to that, if I jump back into the overall view, you can also use this to manage the capacity that you put into an individual warehouse. If I bring up the uh, configure warehouse uh, uh, dialog here, the first piece that you see is uh, the size of the warehouse, which essentially is the compute horsepower that you want to put behind uh, your, uh, your warehouse. Um, and you can see I'm, I'm running with a mid-size to large uh, uh, warehouse here for the purpose of that demo. Um, and you can change uh, or adjust the capacity at any point in time, and it should be effective almost immediately. So that's essentially the size of the warehouse, and it defines the degree of scale-out, the degree of parallelism that you use to process your queries. So that's one of the key performance metrics that you probably want to optimize for as part of tuning your workload. And um, the key piece to look at is uh, the response time that you uh, need to achieve for your queries. Um, as long as you don't achieve acceptable response times, it's uh, appropriate to think about increasing the number of credits or, the, or increasing the size of a warehouse that, that you're running. The second performance dimension that you can work with is the cluster size that you allow for a warehouse. And the cluster is size is, again, uh, is, is uh, roughly the number of compute clusters with the size that you have defined up here that you want to allow your workload to run. Um, in this case, the setting is just one cluster, so I, I can only run one uh, set of VMs uh, dedicated to, uh, to this warehouse. 
And you can see from this dialog here, I can increase that number to go up to, to 10. And Snowflake uh, dynamically monitors your workload and spins up and spins down additional clusters depending on the workload and uh, depending on the waiting conditions uh, that we see. And that's the second dimension of performance optimization in, uh, in Snowflake. In this case, uh, it's key to uh, uh, allow you to address high degrees of concurrency for your local workload. So if you're facing situations where you have thousands of users connected to, uh, to your Snowflake system with potentially hundreds of queries running uh, in parallel at any given point in time, you'll probably find yourself running with, uh, with uh, maximum clusters greater than one. Um, and that's, that's the second key dimension to, to, uh, to work with, particularly for these concurrency-intensive BI workloads. The other neat feature that you see here is the ability to define auto-suspend, which I've turned off for, uh, for this demo. Um, but that essentially is a cost-saving vehicle for you where the compute capacity shuts down if it has been uh, idle for a certain amount of time, which, uh, which you can see here. All right, um, so this has been a quick tour to, um, to the Snowflake UI and loading some data. Let me wrap up by uh, showing some of the Power BI integration capabilities. So here I'm uh, jumping over into, into Power BI, and uh, I've already Power BI started. Let's go into the Get Data dialogs, and uh, let's jump over to Get Data, obviously, from databases. And one of the databases that you find in here that is natively supported by, Snow, uh, by Power BI Desktop is Snowflake. So let's connect to the Snowflake um, uh, account that we just have been using for the demo. And the way that you do that is by grabbing this, uh, this URL up here and putting that into the server dialog. And let's again use the demo warehouse. And you can then choose to either import or import the data into Power BI, or you can also run direct query. Um, I'll go with direct query. Let's bring that up. And now you can see uh, all the databases in the Snowflake account. This is the database that we have been using. Here is our customer table and our tweets table. So let's load both of these. Again, remember, we are in direct query mode. Let's bring those over. Now we have them in the view. Let's jump into the relationships, and let's define a one-to-many relationship between customers and their tweets. And so this should be a one-to-many to this. And hit OK. There is our relationship. And now I can go ahead and define a simple pie chart. And let's say we're interested in the market segment. Let's put that into legend and then the number of customers, the count of uh, tweets that we have seen from customers from different market segments. And you can see that gives us this breakdown between the different market segments in the TPCH data set, furnitures, building, machinery, and so on. Um, we can also look at the actual data that underlies this. And by just glancing at those numbers, you'll probably figure it's all artificially generated data, which is totally true. Um, but uh, with that, you uh, can see that there's uh, essentially some basic steps um, that we just walked through to just illustrate how Power BI works against uh, Snowflake. And now obviously you could go further and say, hey, this is a report that I like and I want to roll it out to the rest of my organization. And then you would go and publish this report, for instance, to the, to the Power BI service. Um, let me stop here and just point out one additional piece. So if you're interested in uh, trying out Snowflake, um, you can go to trial.snowflake.net um, and you'll find a page that looks like this that allows you to uh, sign up for, uh, for a Snowflake trial account, which uh, gives you $400 worth of Snowflake credits to work with through the first uh, 30 days. Um, and obviously, we encourage everyone to, uh, to try out Snowflake if you haven't done that so far on Azure. Um, and with that, I'll 
jump back um, into the slides and then hand it over to uh, to Christine to uh, to go through some of the remaining questions that uh, we still need to answer. Great. Thank you, Torsten. So at this time, we're going to open it up to live Q&A, and if you have any questions, feel free to submit them now. And if we don't get to your question, we will follow up online. So we have one from Yale. He's asking if there's a timeline for other Azure regions, and I can answer that. So we're still prioritizing regions based on customer demand. And our current plan is to have a second Azure region available at the end of this calendar year. Uh, Torsten, for you, please, us, please let us know the Snowflake GA release date. So at this point, um, I think we, uh, uh, we are still going to the public preview and we're still getting a lot of feedback. Um, we, we still need to digest all that feedback and make sure that we address it appropriately before we, uh, be, before we go into a precise uh, date for, for GA. Okay, Yale asks, uh, did the integration Azure services run in our own Azure tenant or in the Snowflake tenant? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that uh, just a little bit. So I think there are, there are two parts to that question. The first one is, uh, is a technical one, which essentially means in what subscriptions are being used to, um, uh, to, to, to run Azure services uh, and, and Snowflake on Azure, and what's the level of isolation uh, be between them? So Snowflake uses its own uh, set of subscriptions in Azure that are powering all of Snowflake on Azure. Um, and uh, all of that is, is, is essentially shielded from the rest of Azure through a set of VNets uh, wrapped around uh, our, our resources and resource groups. Um, so th this, this, this essentially then puts us into a place where when you connect to Snowflake from your Azure resources, your at, at least with the simple connectivity uh, in the standard editions, um, you're, you're connecting from your Azure subscription, your Azure resources, and your Azure VNet to, uh, to, to the Snowflake uh, resources over the public network infrastructure in Azure. Now, for all its connections, um, Snowflake is using encryption. So although we're going over uh, the public uh, uh, infrastructure, network infrastructure in Azure, uh, your data is not accessible as it uh, is in flight. It's uh, TLS encrypted. Now, for some Snowflake editions, we offer a capability that allows us to further secure the channel. That is a capability that we're still working on with the, with the Azure teams. Um, which would give us uh, a deeper integration between the customer VNet and uh, the Snowflake uh, VNet in Azure. Now, that's, that's probably the technical dimension to this. Uh, then there, there might be another uh, business dimension to, to the question, which is on what bill uh, do, does, does uh, my Snowflake consumption show up? So Snowflake at, at, at this point is, uh, is not charged to your Azure bill. So if you're using Snowflake in Azure, you will receive a bill from Snowflake um, and you will pay Snowflake the, the, uh, the, the amount of, uh, uh, of your Azure Snowflake consumption. So I hope this, this answers this question. All right, well, we're almost at the top of the hour. So I just wanna thank everyone for all the great questions. And before we close out our session today, I just want to talk about some next steps. If you're interested in learning more about Snowflake on Azure, we recommend that you look at a couple of blog posts on the topic, and they can be found on snowflake.com. And you can also sign up for a self-service account also by visiting snowflake.com. And these links and resources are available in the resources widget on your screen. And also, we will be sending out a link to this recording of this particular session within 24 hours. With that said, that concludes our session today, and I just want to thank you all and our speakers for being with us, and we hope to see you on a future webinar.